Since the dawn of time, the vast plains of Africa have been the scene of an epic saga, the Great Migrations. Twice a year, wild and free, the great herbivores set out on a journey in search of pasture land. The savanna becomes a conveyor belt crowded with wildebeest, elephants and zebras. Each competes in a race for life that knows few boundaries. But mankind has intervened, dividing up southern Africa with immense enclosures, fences that stretch hundreds of kilometers and separate livestock from wildlife. They have stopped the great flow of animals dead in its tracks. In Botswana, they have decimated the zebra population, brutally cutting off their main migration routes. But the zebra have never stopped trying to find a way through, searching endlessly for a breach in these metal curtains. Little by little, they attempt to reconquer their ancestral paths. It is hard to imagine this patchy land might be the setting for one of the largest migrations on the planet. It is here in Botswana, on the outskirts of the Kalahari Desert, that one of Africa's last two great herds of zebra resides. We're in the Makadi Kadi, an area so desolate that explorers nicknamed it the Big Nothing. It's a fossilized landscape the bottom of an ancient lake that once collected the waters of the Zambezi and the Okavango. A giant basin that disappeared 1,500 years ago into the faults of the growing rift valley. As the lake evaporated, it left behind immense cracked salt pans. This extreme territory is the home of a zebra. It is one of the rare ecosystems still preserved in Africa. Because the land is poor, desolate and unsuitable for farming, man has yet to take over. There are no fences here. In the Makati Kati Park, the animals are free. It's an oasis during the five months of the rainy season, a refuge for all types of wildlife, and an important stop off for thousands of migratory animals. During this period, from November to March, it maintains the misleading allure of an aquatic garden. It is during the dry season, which begins in March and April, that the big nothing really merits its name. Elephants take dust baths to fight off the heat. The wildebeest seek shade under the balsam trees. Zebras enjoy their last meal of this mineral rich grass. But everyone is on high alert. They know that soon the desert will seize hold of both the beasts and the plant life. The animals prepare to leave before it's too late. It is the end of April. At the height of the dry season, the water has dried up, leaving the depths wrinkled with pines. It is time for the zebras to leave the Makati Kali. Two men will follow their journey. Dabe Sebitola is one of Botswana's top nature guides. James Bradley is an English biologist with a passion for zebras. They want to check out a route today. The zebras will be able to cross the barriers to rejoin their original paths of migration. But how will they pass through the metal fence? And at what price? Yeah, look, here's the track. Yeah. Comes all the way. This must be one of the first tracks the zebras migrating this year, do you think? Yeah, and they're quite fresh as well. They yeah. might be somewhere there. Zebras have think? started their migration back to the Bajeti. Yeah. Yeah, check on the horizon, just moving away. Wow, look at that. That's a big head, huh? You see the wildebeest behind? Yeah. Fantastic. A couple hundreds, huh? Fantastic. We're going to follow the migration this year, Dabe. Yeah. Let's go. We're going to follow from all the way down here in the Makati Kati salt pans. Yeah. All the way past Naipan. That's the Naipan. And we're going to follow the zebras all the way from 
Pans to the Bateti, yeah. to Kumaka. Some might even come all the way past Naipan, all the way up to the Okavango Delta. Okay, so this is our Delta. All the way up there. Yeah. So we've got a long way to go. We've got a lot to learn along the way. Yeah. So let's go first. We'll go to the Buteti. To the Buteti. And then we'll try and follow them all the way up. See if we can catch them again in the Delta. Yeah. You ready? Good idea. Let's go. Let's go, man. From the paths of the Buteti River and up to the Okavango, the journey is 250 kilometers long. In total, a circular migration of 500 kilometers. The zebras will encounter three different habitats. The desert and its great thirst, the bush and its predators, and finally the marshes. They're familiar with these natural constraints. They know how to avoid them, but they will face even harder obstacles along their route, those created by man. Potetti fence, buffalo fence, and Xai Pan fence. The entire country is separated by these iron curtains. Why? In the 1950s, Botswana, independent but lacking in resources, decided to turn to farming. Cows became known as black diamonds that would ensure the country's economic takeoff. Europe was prepared to buy its meat, but on one condition that fences be built to protect the livestock from diseases affecting the wildlife. The fence routes were hastily designed by offices of technocrats. They had no idea of the natural equilibriums existing in Africa, which rely on the absolute mobility of the animals. Without any research on their impact, the country was soon covered in 5,000 kilometers of metal. It was a wide-scale imprisonment. During the dry season, the animals could no longer retreat to fortunate ecosystems such as the Okavango, rich in food and water. Zebra numbers plummeted. There were no more than 110,000 zebra in the 1980s, and only 16,000 30 years later. They never stopped fighting for survival, searching endlessly for a break in the infernal web of fencing. Today, as at the beginning of every migration, they must first cross the Makadikadi. In this vast territory of 12,000 square kilometers, the trackers have found the zebra, appearing as if from nowhere they gradually regroup as though guided by some higher force. The water holes are drying up. Grasses are no longer as nutritious as they were. These zebras are starting to make the decision, now's the time to migrate. Now we need to go back to an abundance of water in the Bateti River, make the most of the water there to survive the long dry season. Still in a good condition from the wet season grazing, but the walk, the migration is going to take a little bit out of them. It need to be a long walk for those fowls. Eh? Matriarch of the harem will lead. She's the one that needs the most nutrients. She's still nursing the foal. She needs to make sure that her foal survives the long dry season and makes it back out to the pans next wet season. As soon as the rains come, they'll return this way. The zebras are in good health. For six months, they have been able to enjoy the pans of rich grasses. They are ready to take the great leap towards the Bateti River. The wildebeest will accompany them on the journey. So when the zebra win the Makadikadi with the wildebeest, they're complementary, they're allies in the migration. By working together, they have safety in numbers, and the zebra also facilitate the grazing for the wildebeest. Zebra being bulk foragers are happier to graze the tougher, older grass, while the wildebeest being ruminants prefer the lusher green grass at the roots. The animals group together. The large males let out powerful whinnies, a call to arms for the herds that echo across kilometers. The larger and more compact the group, the stronger it will be. At every corner of the herd, lookouts watch for predators. 
All of the large herbivores have eyes set very high in their skull that allow them to survey a large field of vision. But above all, it is their stripes that they rely on to save their skin in any situation. They help to repel the tsetse fly, which are confused by black and white. But that's not all. The reason why these animals have got this uh, black and white color is because black and white is a very good thermal cooling system. Black is a very good conductor of heat, so it absorbs heat, and uh, white is a bad conductor of heat, so it reflects off the heat. And these two uh, different uh, temperatures create the airflow, which uh, keeps these animals very, very cool, even in the heat of the day. And when they are running, it's very, very difficult for a lion to identify one animal. So to like target on one animal. So he will always miss the animal. He will always miss. Every zebra has its own pattern of stripes, each as unique as a fingerprint. In their infancy, zebra foals stay close to their mothers so that they can memorize her pattern. This helps them to identify them from the thousands of others scanning the herd, each with their own barcode. They need all the maternal protection they can get. One in two young will not survive migration. The entire zebra community closes ranks to ensure survival. They live in these family groups. And these family groups consist of the stallion. The stallion can have up to nine females. The dominant female is the one who is responsible for migrating, you know. She will always leave the area and she will be leading the group. She will be always in front. And uh, she will walk, uh, choosing areas which have got very good pastures. Young males play fight, a rehearsal for the real battles to create a harm some months later. They will continue to play until their imminent departure. zebras await the signal. They make the most of the cool evening to feed and strengthen the bonds within the group. to the west, a thick fog settles over the acacias and thorny scrubs. The area, which seemed condemned to drought, is suddenly bathed in vapor. A miracle that occurs at best once every year, the great Boteti River begins to refill, sending its mist out across the fatigued land. <laughs> This is the signal the zebras have been waiting for. From far away, they've been able to see this natural life-giving phenomenon, the water's return. Every year, the rivers that feed the high plateaus of Angola, hundreds of kilometers to the north, make a six-month journey to the heart of Botswana. They recharge the parched delta of the Hokovango, Thank you. 
Recently, due to climate change, this wave has reached as far as the edge of the Kalahari, filling the bed of the Buteti River. It's a renaissance, as if by magic, the hippopotamus returned, and the crocodiles emerged from the caves where they have waited for the water. Today, the Buteti River reaches as far as the entrance to the Makadikadi in the height of the dry season. It provides resources for the animals. Though the Buteti is a land full of promise, it's also a trap. It is divided by an intimidating barrier, the Buteti fence. Built when the river was dry, it still stands today. The Buteti River stopped flowing in the early 90s. And when it stopped flowing, all these animals which were coming in, into these areas, like the zebras, the wildebeest, and uh, including our hippos, were suffering. Huh? They suffer a lot. It creates this big, 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 big problem uh, between uh, the locals and, uh, and the wildlife. Because uh, before, when the river was still there, it was a natural uh, boundary. But uh, since it stopped flowing, it was a big mix-up. So cows will cross into the park, lions will get into uh, the human uh, area, and um, this is uh, when the government then decided to put up this massive fence, which was uh, zigzagging um, along the Buteti rivers. Two hundred kilometers to the east, the females have heard the call of the river, the promise of water and fresh grass. Everything they need to feed their young, they give the signal to leave. Under the watchful eye of the meerkats, their long journey begins towards the Buteti River. One by one, the zebras come together to form an immense column. The impressive Makadikadi herd sets off. The zebra foals enjoy their last carefree moments. Born here in the luxury of the green season, they are launched at six months old into the dry exodus. close together throughout the journey. The solidarity enables the zebra to confront all dangers ahead. Adults stay together throughout their life. Migration after migration, they forge unbreakable bonds, gaining experience that turns them into super parents, guides. Like the zebra, the elephants must synchronize their movements with the water and grass resources. En route to the Buteti, they abandon a land which is quickly drying out. Vegetation that following its last blossom will soon become dormant. Far away, the giant baobab trees, the only markers on the horizon, guide the migrating populations. This year, the trees bear no fruit. It's a sign that the drought will be intense, and the baobabs are never grown. The salt pans seem to have consumed the savannah, like a sterile, salty ice cap, pushing back the life before it.
After two days crossing the pads, the dominant female leads the herd to the last watering hole in the big nothing. The water is briny, heavy with minerals from the inland sea that covered the Makadi Gadi. But it's the only place to drink in the hundred kilometers still separating them from the potato. Any mistake in the female's directions could lead them into the limits of the great white desert. Many days of that water lie ahead, a huge challenge for the zebra. The wildebeest and antelopes can survive in the metabolic water from plants, but not the zebra. And yet the mares are disciplined when taking turns to drink from the last watering hole. The herd is left to pans for good. It seems to have taken everything that lives with it. The salt flats now reflect only the blinding image of the big nothing, an awesome empty space. James leaves the Batetti to keep a lookout for the front of the herd. Darby follows the zeal from day to day. At times it disappears like a mirage, leaving only tracks behind. Returning to the path, Dabi finds a community of hunter-gatherers, the Sam. The first inhabitants of South Africa, they have followed the herbivore migrations for thousands of years. Together the tribe responds in the click language to questions about the zebras. For the Sam, everyone is encouraged to express themselves. It's part of the democracy of speech and everyone understands each other. In the past, there were so many zebras. It's a cake on So many zebras. But now, the number is less because of the fence, trussing. Uh, actually, like, uh, they are predators eating them, normally killing them. But uh, when there is no fence, then they can move from that place to another. But when they stay in uh, one place, there is no way to go. And during the dry season, the area gets the wildfires. Then they do not have a chance of moving from one place or migrating from one place to another where they can find fresh grasses. Then they will be starved. The fences change a lot in our lifestyle. Because uh, the things we, we, we used to do, like moving from one place to another, we no longer do it like in the past. So now we have to settle down in a long time for one place. <laughs> I asked them several times if they do hunt zebras and they said no, we don't hunt them. And I was like, even if <coughs> there is no food, you still don't hunt them? And they're like, we, we take them as donkeys, we take them as uh, animals which are decorating nature, so we don't hunt them. They are so attractive. Barely a century ago, the sands still shared the desert and the savannah with the great herds in total freedom. Permanent movement was the best way to adapt to the constraints of nature. Man followed beast, which in turn followed nature. They adopted their rhythms, seasons and paths. The fences have blocked all the roads. They have made life difficult for all nomads, who are now disappearing from the African horizon. Seen from above, the desert, like the palm of a hand, is wrinkled with thousands of mythical paths. From this tangled maze, the zebras must find the correct track. Three days later, the travelers reach the bush. After the wide open spaces of the pans, it's a closed, oppressive world, 
a labyrinth of thorns. The giraffes and elephants accompany them towards the west. For them, the bush is a nourishing ecosystem, but the grass-loving zebras remain hungry. And yet they need to graze in large amounts to extract their small dose of protein. Their digestive system is more rustic than the rodents of the savannah. The giraffes, wildebeest and antelopes that consciously chew the cud. In these galleries of acacias and thorns, the zebras are nervous. They feel more vulnerable to predators that could be hiding anywhere. But their striped coat once again helps them to hide from sight. Dabe has followed the zebra's trail to the bush. This young yearling, an 18-month zebra, hasn't survived the challenges of the second migration. The vultures have left only the skin. But they're also stalked by another danger. The lions also know the migration routes. Positioned in strategic points, they block the zebra's access to the Matadi. Facing the mass of zebras, they organize themselves into a group, a pride against a herd. seems paralyzed. With their highly developed senses, the millions of sensitive cells that line their nostrils, the zebras perceive a huge amount of information that merges together. They can smell the nearby water, arousing their thirst. But mixed with the smell of water, there's now also the smell of big cats. They're cornered, even more so because before them stands an old enemy, the Botetti fence, an immense metal circle that zigzags around the river blocking their access. Faced with all these obstacles, the herd separates. Each harm goes to explore a path, and the luckiest comes back to inform the herd. Throughout the night, under the light of the full moon, the zebras go in search of a passage through. Since they left the pans five days ago, the river has continued to grow. It now stretches more than 120 meters wide. After years of drought, the Boteti as in the time of its great majesty, answers all the thirsts of the bush. It's a miracle of nature, and for the wildlife, a genuine godsend. The elephants, with no fear of predators, are the first to take noisy possession of the area. Tormented by thirst, but extremely cautious, the zebras send out a scout. 
The most experienced has remembered a path through one of the rare trails the Betetti that is free of fences. The zebra examines the area carefully from the cliff's edge. There seems to be no danger. It lets out a discreet call by vibrating its nostrils. It's the signal that the thousands of other zebras hidden in the bush were waiting for. Timid at first, but then arriving in increasingly large numbers, they descend upon the Buteti. They have completed the first step in their incredible migration. The Makadikadi herd is soon there too, almost in its entirety. Many thousands have completed the long journey from the salt pans and the Kadikadi to the Great River. It's a moment of deliverance, but also of great tension. In this position, they are exposed to attacks from lions and crocodiles. It's the first time that the young born that year taste the fresh water of the Bateki. It's the pure taste of paradise. After the desert and the bush, it's the beginning of a new chapter for the zebras, moving to the rhythms of their comings and goings between the river and the pastures. This life seems easier at first. Many will stay here for six months, when the rains revive the pans in November, they will leave. James and Darby meet near the Batetti fence, but the zebras knew how to go around. They travel the length of the double fence to meet as high and 250 kilometers long that borders the park. It was built when the river had receded to prevent predators from attacking the livestock. You know, it's amazing to think that all of this riverbed was dry just a few years ago. Yeah, and now the river is back again. Yeah, it's back with the flood still to come, but the fence is still holding. Oh, Only yeah. a small yeah, section, it's, but it's yeah. resisting. Yeah, it's amazing, huh? But I wonder, will we see anything drinking? There's a zebra cuckoo here. It's a male zebra. Yeah. You can you can you can tell by yeah, this canine. From those canines. Yeah. And how do you think the lions got it? Uh, lions are using the fence uh, to run to chase animals into the fence, and then the fence will help okay. uh, the lions with the hunting. So it's the hunting strategy to use the fence in the river. Yeah. To block the animal. And yeah. Make it easy to catch. Very easy to catch. As you can see, there's a big hole there. Okay. And probably this animal ran into this hole and lions managed to to catch him. Okay. And is he an old guy? Yeah. He looks, look at the teeth. Yeah. So worn. Yeah, the teeth are... Uh, so he's probably 14, 15. Yeah. Although the fence acts as a trap for zebras faced with lions, for James, the biologist, it still has many virtues. Most of the fences in Botswana are built as veterinary fences. So they're built to reduce the spread of disease between livestock and wildlife. This fence was built as a conflict fence. And in the mid-90s, while the levels of conflict were increasing, the idea came that maybe we could build a fence to mitigate the conflict between the humans and wildlife. To, and recreate the physical barrier that was removed when the river disappeared. Lions were crossing out, killing livestock, killing cows and donkeys, while the livestock were also coming into the park and competing with the zebras and the wildebeest for the limited grazing resources in the dry season. By excluding the livestock from the national park, almost immediately after the fence was built, the wildlife were able to come into the riverbed, no longer competing with livestock no longer competing with the farmers who would chase them away. So they were able to come into the riverbed during the day, able to rest and drink at their will. It's difficult to, to quantify the exact impacts, but in, in this terms, this Makati Fahiri fence has, has been fairly positive um, in, in a different way that was maybe slightly unexpected when it was initially built.
For James, the Batetti fence seems exonerated of any negative impact. But the fences are too sensitive a subject to be discussed in complete transparency. In reality, the livestock still enters the natural park, the lions still penetrate the ranches, and continue their raids on the cows. And how could this barrier be beneficial for the zebra in the long term? It has removed a large part of the river and its banks for the benefit of farming. It blocks wildlife, forcing it to stay concentrated in small areas where water is still accessible. In fact, near to the river, with the advancing dry season, the situation is becoming increasingly critical for the zebra. Competition at watering holes is exacerbated by the presence of less vulnerable beasts, such as the elephant and hippopotamus. trampled underfoot, no longer offer grass or shade. To find pastures that are still green, the harams must move further and further away from the Boteti, only to come back to drink. It's an exhausting balancing act, and one that exposes them to great danger. The lions have not left the herd. They have simply moved their pride some 15 kilometers away from the Boteti to an area of green land. For the zebras, it's also a red zone. After each attack, the harms must reform around a dominant stallion. The herd rebuilds like a single organism. Yeah, some zebra just through here. Yeah. But they're nervous. Yeah. Uh, check. Check those herds coming to drink. Yeah. Hey. Fantastic. And they come back and drink only every three days, traveling 15, 20 kilometers to find suitable grazing. It's a long way. And you can see that some of those zebras, they've lost some condition. They're already starting to show a little bit too much skin and bone. It's going to be a tough few months for them in the, the long, hot, dry season. And it's lovely to see the, the younger foals. The foals born in December last year, January this year. They are now approaching their first dry season. If they've come this far, they've, they've got good parents. The mares and the stallions are looking after them. These harems are tough. And some of them, maybe one or two of these harems, might just carry on to the Okavango. They might keep going, because they want to make the most of the historical movement. They migrate back to the delta. A few dozen zebra, the most nervous in the group, feel trapped by the Boteti. Trapped between the lions, fences and elephants, and the increasing scarcity of food, they no longer want to wait for the end of the dry season on the banks of the dead end river. A single event causes the departure. A wave of heat 100 kilometers to the north in the Okavango. 
By using the sensors to scan the atmosphere, the winds, and the hygrometry, the zebras sense this far off ecosystem and evaluate their food resources. Up there, water and green pastures will be available in unlimited amounts. The group responds to the call of the Okavango. They will launch into a new migration to face even more barriers. The second stage of their odyssey begins. It takes new breath. For some years, a new piece of information has become etched in the memory of the species. Space is opening up. This fence is similar to the Nipan fence, which was erected in 1968 to, to separate wildlife and livestock. But after 36 years, it was decided that the fence was no longer needed. So the fence was decommissioned in 2004. A few years after decommissioning, some zebra, which had been collared by a colleague of mine, Dr. Hattie Bartland Brooks, had restarted a migration through where the fence had stood for 36 years. So this map shows the movement of one zebra when the seasonal water holes began to dry up. The zebra migrates back, reaching through Kamaka and the Bacchetti River, falling on having one last drink before carrying on up to the Okavango Delta. The removal of this fence, the northern Naipan fence, and the re-establishment re of this migration gives us hope that by allowing for the free movement of wildlife through new passages or through new channels, it gives the conservationists hope that if we open up landscapes, if we connect habitats, if we remove habitat fragmentation, animals can find a way, they can find a passage, they can make the migration occur once more. The Naipan fence, built to protect the sacrosanct livestock, was eventually broken down. The elephants breached it first. They used a tried and tested technique. Large males pushed the younger males into the electric fences. They smashed it down, acting like a battering ram. The path was free. Maintenance of this monumental fence in the middle of nowhere soon became a bottomless pit for money. In the end, doubt set in about the real merits of these metal enclosures. What if the zebras and wildlife were more profitable to Botswana's economy than the livestock? What if they were the real treasure? Environmental pressure groups did the rest. The result? Along a hundred kilometers, chain by chain, this fence, a sinister memory, was torn down. Thousands of zebras have died here, tangled in the metal, at a time when the Naipan fence had turned the savannah into a prison. Today, the few harms of zebras that attempted the journey have managed to pass through. To make up for lost time, they take the shortest route, snaking between the fences of the last ranches before the delta. The harms must mix with the livestock to share watering holes. They're forced to cohabitate for a few hours with the cows that continuously graze in their territory. Two destinies cross in a single valley. The zebras have no problem tearing themselves away from this forced overcrowding. They reach their goal. 
the Ockervango. The zebras are at the entrance to the Ockervango. Here, there are few predators, and they're easy to outrun in the marshes. There is all the water and grass they can need, and no more fences. All the migrations seem to have come here to this inland sea, whilst everywhere else drought reigns. The travellers from the Roteti mix with the settled animals of the Okovango. The animals have regained their tranquility after a series of long and difficult challenges. It is now, at the end of their journey, that they will take the time to memorise the route, to pass it on to their young, and perhaps enter it once again into the genetic map of the species. Zebras here are incredible. They manage to find a passage through the buffalo fence and they walk all the way up to the Okavango Delta here. We still have got very few numbers because uh, these are the only ones which have learned the way around the fence to here. Hopefully we might get more zebras which will find their way up to the Delta. Thanks to their courage and their extraordinary ability to read natural phenomena and move from one area to the next to exploit their natural resources, the zebras have managed to reclaim the entire length of their migration. They have shown that nature is resilient even in its most complex movements. They have allowed no one, least of all the farmers, to deprive them of nature's most beautiful gift, space. They have kicked back against this unstable model which transforms the savannas into a factory for livestock. So when the Makati Kati becomes green once again, no barrier will stand in their way. They will continue on their journey and give birth to the next generation.